When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and getting all of his lessons for life from Prison Mike, here is the captain. Yeah, this is how we talk in the clink. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week we are featuring Rollerblade by the creative minds over at one of the very, very best in the beer business, Hoof Hearted. This is a dry... Come on, get it together. This is a double dry hopped double IPA. That's what Tim Duncan calls a double, double blade. Garage grade four and three quarter bottle caps out of five. And here's some cheers to our good friends. First up... Thank you to Francesca in Springfield, Illinois. And a big shout out to Jennifer in Cranston, Rhode Island. It's neither a road nor an island. Discuss amongst yourselves. Next up, we have Megan in Beaver, Oklahoma. And another shout out to Megan, but she's in Spring, Texas. Here we go. We have a shout for Tanya in Grove City, Ohio. And last but certainly not least, we have Mark and Gemma in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Thank you to everyone who helped us fill up the fridge for this week's beer fund. Yeah, thanks for the support for the BWEWRUN beer run. For all of our old episodes, download the Stitcher app. And for our bonus show, check it out on Stitcher Premium. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. satisfy the police. When I did that, I used the opportunity to move the blame onto Ryan and off of myself. Things happened much differently than I had previously stated. When we left the club, I cannot, honest, I cannot honestly remember if we had robbery on our minds. I made up the statement about Ryan giving me the tire iron and saying that we might get messed up without it. I imagined that it might have occurred that way because I knew I had beaten the victim with a tire iron. I could not accept in my conscious mind 
that I was the sole perpetrator and aggressor, so I put a lot of the blame on Ryan. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think that much of, much of it was even consciously done. It was just too hard to admit to myself and others that I had killed someone. I could not even accept the possibility of it. <clears throat> we had never done robberies before. We never did them after. We broke a lot of stuff, which was probably what we had in mind when we left the club. I believe that I flipped out and committed the entire act alone and with little forethought. I remember feeling psychotically giddy, if that's understandable. Uh, I did not tell Ryan what I was going to do. He had no idea that I would act in such an aggressive manner. I don't remember how much of, how much of it he was there for. He could not stop me. He, he could not stop me, though he tried at the end. If he had wanted to stop me before and during much of the act, I was armed with a tire tool. Ryan did not say, come on, let's get this over with, while I was stalking the victim. He was actually pleading, come on, let's go. He did not want to part in it. Again, I turned it around because I did not want to accept the responsibility of the sole perpetrator. I strangled Ken Heidholt to death. I did not remember this until the police told me what he was strangled with. When I said, that's fucked up, after they told me what he was strangled with, I just remembered doing it. I then denied remembering it. I lied right there. That was the first blatant lie. <clears throat> it was then that I knew I had done it. I was worried about survival. It was too hard to throw away my entire life and put my head on, quote, the chopping block. See, uh, see the video of the interrogation for that. I tried telling the police that I might have strangled the victim. One of the officers stopped me. He got mad. He did not want to hear that I might have done it. Again, see the video. Before I knew I had done it, I consciously assumed it was Ryan because it was too hard to accept that I might have done it. I made up what I said about Ryan being on top of the victim. I lied about him strangling the victim to everyone from Nick Gilpin to the jury. On a subconscious level, I've always known that I did it. That is a part of me that I have accepted. I enjoyed doing it at the time. I was in a lot of pain and felt the need to take it out on someone else. There was something wrong with me. I regret now that I put an innocent man through that. He didn't deserve it. I don't lose sleep over it, though. It's more that I feel it was a sort of violation. He had, had he been my enemy, I wouldn't regret it, except for the prison time that came with it. I lied at the proffer about ripping the belt off, pushing Ryan off of the victim, and leaving the scene with the belt. I made this up after I read Dallas Mallory's statement that he had seen me with something in my hand. There were also two un unidentified witnesses in the car who could have seen me with the belt. I had to have an excuse for having the belt in case it came up later. <clears throat> Ryan was actually the one who pushed me off of the victim. He probably wouldn't have been successful except that the belt broke at the same time. My original story didn't make sense. I don't know why the police didn't question it. Why would I stop beating the victim, snap out of my rage, and then Ryan strangle him? I beat the victim, Kent Heidholt, until he was on the ground. Then I took his belt off and strangled him with it. At first I said that I thought I had thrown up at the scene. I did throw up, but it was later. I'm not sure where. Maybe at the Osco uh, or Jewel or whatever it was. Maybe in their parking lot, I'm not sure. Saying that I thought I got sick at the scene was convenient because it removed me from the situation. I said I was sitting on the curb feeling nauseous in between the time that I stopped beating the victim and I pushed Ryan off of Kent Heidel. That was a lie. Ryan never touched the victim. <clears throat> I lied about remembering taking items from the victim, though I believe I did. Uh, that was all assumptions and trying to pacify the police and prosecutors. I lied about putting things in a bag in Ryan's car. I didn't remember that. I believe that when Ryan took the money out of his wallet when we were out of his own wallet when we were back at the bar and said how pointless my actions were, he meant just that. He was asking why I had done it. How could he have forgotten about money in his wallet? I'm not sure that I remember him saying that he had always wanted to kill someone before he turned 60 on the night of the murder. If he did say it, he may have just been trying to act tough. The witness stated that the kid with highlights in their hair had told the cleaning lady to get help. Ryan had highlights, not me. I can't remember who told the cleaning people to get help. I remember feeling astounded when I was told by the police that it actually happened. I still don't know where I still don't know where that memory came from. Uh, 
what what were my out of control statements to Christian Blankenship and Julie Dunn in the parking lot? Uh, I don't know. That that's something that 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 I'd like to know, and they should pro probably be asked about. Uh, and finally, after the murder, I remember telling Ryan that it didn't matter who did what because we were both there. I said this so he would keep his mouth shut. That's it. Okay, let me ask you just a couple of follow-up questions. So, <clears throat> are you saying today that you are the sole murderer of Kent Heidhold? That's correct, yes. Okay. And are you saying that uh, Ryan had no idea when you went uh, to the parking lot where you encountered Ken Heidholt, what you were going to do? That's correct. Are you saying that there was no plan between the two of you to commit a robbery that night? I don't know. I don't you, know. Do you have a recollection of that? I can't remember what we intended to do. I don't know. Um, what was the position of Mr. Heidholt when he was strangled? He was face down. Okay. Um, I want to ask you again, um, is it correct that you're the one who declined to have an attorney present today? That's correct. And are you currently on any medication of any type? No, I'm not. Okay. Do you feel that you're making this statement uh, from your memory of the events of what happened that night? That's correct. Okay. I don't have any further questions. We are joined here in the garage today by a longtime friend of the show, Maggie Freeling. Maggie is the host and producer of the Unjust and Unsolved podcast. Longtime listeners of our show will know her from helping us out with our Shaker Heights project, as well as her work on the Mara Murray case, as she was featured in Oxygen TV's documentary, The Disappearance of Mara Murray, thank you for joining us here in the garage today, Maggie. Please take us through and tell us about your new project. Hello, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I, I'm, you know, this is really exciting because most of the times that we've talked and, and done stuff together has been about Maura Murray, but this is a complete 180. I'm now working on wrongful convictions. You know, this project. We conceived it by we, I mean, Patrick Hines of True Crime Obsessed um, about a year ago, and we just launched in September. And each week I cover a case of a person that um, I strongly believe has been wrongfully incarcerated. And I heard you talking on your podcast about the Innocence Project, and there's a the rough estimation or the, the low estimation is 20,000 individuals are in prison that are innocent. Yeah. And I would say that's definitely super low. I mean, that's just people that we know of that have petitioned the Innocence Project. I mean, there are so many people that I've even heard from who write to me saying, hey, I'm innocent, but the Innocence Project won't take my case. They only take DNA cases. So, you know, they're not going to take a case that doesn't have some sort of DNA evidence. So that leaves out so many cases, hundreds of thousands of cases. And you know, if you listen to my podcast, most of my cases have not been taken by the Innocence Project. They're either ballistic cases or accidental, you know, baby murders involving choking or falling. So these are all cases that are very likely not even in those statistics. And a good portion of these wrongfully convicted inmates have been convicted based off of false confessions. And we now know from DNA evidence that even in DNA cases where DNA will exonerate the person who has been convicted of the murder, 25% of the time with a false confession, the DNA proves that it was in fact false and that we have put the wrong person in prison. And those numbers alone if you carry that out further to cases with no DNA, you would think roughly 25% is going to apply to those cases as well. So yes, I think, I think the 20,000 estimate is very conservative, very low. And it's amazing how, unfortunately, yes, these organizations have to prioritize these cases, which ones they take on, which ones they choose, because they're just 
are so many of them out there. That's that's the saddest part is, you know, there are these ones that early on in this, I got a couple letters from a man who had a very sympathetic story. But even for me, it's tough to cover it because I'm like, have you had a private investigator? Have you had any of these things? And he's like, his niece accused him of sexually assaulting her in some form. I don't, I didn't really get into too many details with him, but there was, there was really no way of, of proving his innocence in that sense. And, and, you know, there's so many of these out there. So it's been tough. It's definitely been tough hearing these stories. And so many of them I can't even cover just, just because I wouldn't have enough evidence to feel comfortable saying this is a wrongful conviction. Right. Because you don't want to possibly give a criminal a platform. Mm -hmm. Now, when we started talking about you doing a podcast in general, I mean, this was probably three years ago at CrimeCon, but you were stating, I believe on your show that that Charles's case was the first case that you actually, or the first person you actually made contact with before you started producing your show. Yeah. So I reached out to a lot of people. So, you know, in the intro of my show, it says 20 folks, which is true. I did reach out to at least 20 folks and sent a uh, snail mail. And he, he wrote back immediately. I mean, Charles is a incredibly intelligent on the ball person and he just wants people to know about what happened to him which is just so I, I, there are no words to even explain what has happened to him and why he's still in prison and so he was you know one of the first people the first person that I really got to know and to this day I would say you know Charles is a friend I've put his episode out, but I, here I am, you know, still advocating for him, you know, still getting people to listen to his story, to listen to his side of the story, because to him, that's really the most important. He's been portrayed in the media for so long as this crazy person who wrongfully and knowingly put Ryan Ferguson in prison, which is not the story at all. So for me, you know, it was really important to, to talk to Charles and, and hear what he has to say. Well, in this story, it involves the unjust convictions of two individuals and therefore leads us to the unsolved murder. And can you take us through the attack and murder of Columbia Daily Tribune sports editor Kent Heitholt? So this is the perfect time of year to tell this story because it was Halloween night 2001. Kent Heitholt, he was the sports editor for the Columbia Tribune. This is in Columbia, Missouri. He's leaving work super, super late. It's around 2.10 a.m. that he says goodbye to his colleague near his car. And he is later found sometime, you know, 10 minutes later around 2.20 a.m. brutally beaten and strangled in the Tribune parking lot. Again, this is Kent Heitholt. He was 48 years old. He's a family man, brutally beaten and strangled in the parking lot. He was leaving work, but he also like stopped to feed a cat. Yeah, so that's what I was reading in some of these old papers. He stopped to feed a cat, and that's in – so Michael Boyd, and we'll get to him, as you guys know, in a little bit. He is a colleague. I believe he was also a sports writer. I think, I think Kent was his boss. He's the last person to see him alive in the parking lot, and they were talking about you know feeding these cats, and then according to Boyd, he leaves and – and almost immediately after that, Heitholt is beaten, strangled, bludgeoned, and left for dead. And two of the workers, two other people working at this building, they see or believe they saw something in the parking lot. They call this into 911 to say that Kent has been attacked in the parking lot. We need paramedics. We need police. Yes. Two janitors, Shana Ornt and Jerry Trump. They are two janitors. And so according to Shana, she has multiple affidavits. She comes out and sees two young white folks who allegedly say someone is hurt and then they leave. And she sees Kent Heitholt, her, her colleague, and she calls the police and there's a 911 call that you can listen to. It's her and Jerry Trump calling the police saying, Kent is laying in the parking lot. He's not moving. We need help. But the case doesn't really go anywhere, right? We have two potential witnesses. We have some physical evidence at the scene, but this man was beat to death in the parking lot and choked. And the case doesn't really seem to go anywhere. This takes us to the two year anniversary marker 
and the Columbia Daily Tribune, they start running the story again. One of their own has been murdered on their property, and they're trying to get some answers for Kent Heitholt, who used to work for the Tribune. As far as the evidence they have, they have blood evidence, they have fingerprints, they have shoe prints, they have the 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 weapon, they have obviously these two eyewitnesses that saw these other two individuals. We don't know if they're attackers or if they were just passer buyers or if they were witnesses to the crime. So they do have quite a bit of evidence, but like you said, it just doesn't go anywhere. Part of that evidence is um, Shayna does a police composite sketch. So on this anniversary of the murder, like you said, two years later in 2003, the Columbia Tribune puts out this sketch from Shayna. And then this is where we get into the entire story of Charles and Ryan. This sketch comes out in the paper and Charles Erickson, who at the time just remembers that this was Halloween night, he was doing a lot of drugs, <laughs> including cocaine, pills. Um, he's going to also have done LSD, mushrooms. You know, he's a high school kid. He's just experimenting. This right. night he blacks out. And so two years later, he sees in the paper this sketch that he thinks looks a lot like him. You know, I would argue it, it looks like a pretty generic uh, young white man, you know, buzz cut, pretty, pretty generic looking. But Charles is thinking, oh my gosh, I was at a party near there it was Halloween night. I have no idea what happened. I was completely blackout. This looks like me. Hold on. What's going on? Did I have something to do with this? Yeah, which is very interesting because taking a look at Charles and looking at this sketch, I don't think they look anything alike personally. Yeah, I don't I don't really think so either. But Charles, and this is where I, I always thought it was so important to tell his story because you know, not only did he allegedly have substance abuse issues, I would say he's just a, a teenager just, you know, doing his thing. But OK, people are calling it substance abuse issues. Not only did he have that, but he did also have, you know, OCD, anxiety, you know, some some mental issues as well that were really causing him to think about this and overthink about this and obsess over this. A and guess with that obsessing, he he really thought this looked like him. and he went to Ryan and said, Hey man, did we have anything to do with this? And Ryan was like, what are you even talking about, dude? I dropped you off at home after the party around one thirty. you were home. Like get, get away right. from me. This is crazy. This show is sponsored by better help. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. You can live out your master chef dreams when you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.
now knowing Charles and having a, a friendship with him, do you know if he has been diagnosed with any mental disorder? Yeah. Yeah. So those are currently in all of his appeals, like these compounding factors. That's with it too, that, that, you know, he was someone who was troubled, did have, you know, some mental disorders and the police completely took advantage of that. At the time that I spoke with his lawyer, that appeal wasn't in yet. So he didn't get too into details, but now that I've read them, like, yes, he, he has OCD, he has anxiety. He does take medication for it. He is in therapy for it now, but back then at 17 years old, compounding with drinking a lot, doing cocaine, doing LSD, it was, it was not a good combination. This case has always been on my radar because when you see the, I, I believe it was Dateline the first time I heard about it, it's so scary to think being in Ryan's shoes and all, and I've always viewed this case through Ryan Ferguson's lens that you're out at this party and you're drinking and having a good time. And at some point it's time to go home. I'm going to drop off my buddy and then I'm going to go home. And two and a half years later, I am being pulled into, they're questioning me now. Well, one on these events, and yes, I mean, it happened on Halloween, so it's a little bit easier to remember what happened, but could you imagine if it was not on Halloween, how less of the story he would have known? Um, and if you watch those interrogations, it's it, they're scary to watch because they're feeding Charles all this information, and then the other interrogation, you have Ryan going, look. I I wasn't even there. Yeah. I, so or I guess my question would be how much do you think time played a factor in this meaning the cops had really nothing to go off of for two and a half years. So do you think that played into the way they handled this case? I do. Um they wanted it solved and you know this case is a is a Oftentimes, you know, when I'm looking in these cases, we know that there's been some kind of misconduct, but it it could be accidental. You know, I was covering a case where the prosecution unknowingly withheld evidence because the officers never even gave it to the prosecution. So, So that was like a complete accident. Prosecutor had no idea there was all of this exculpatory evidence because the police withheld it. But in this, it is like such a clear cut. The police manufactured this conviction. The police and prosecutor manufactured this conviction because with all of the people who later recant, Jerry Trump, the the janitor, they got to make a false statement about Ryan and Charles. You know, he recants and says, you know, the prosecutor told me what to say. The police were giving Charles Erickson multiple. I only talk about one in my podcast. You know, I don't have a lot of time to go into every little detail, but there are at least two other manufactured alleged confessions of people saying, Ryan confessed to me. They showed this to Charles saying, you know, look, Ryan's telling people that you guys did this. There's another one um, where allegedly a girl heard Ryan confessing at a party and they show this to Charles and say, look, she heard Ryan confessing. All of this was manufactured. All of this was faked by the police. And it is so egregious what they did to Charles and Ryan. But they got Charles to confess because of all of these false police reports they were giving to him. You know, time, I think, in the sense that they wanted to solve it. But Ryan knew the whole time where he was, what he did. There were multiple Brady violations in this case. There were multiple people who said, we saw them leave. We saw them go home. And that was all withheld from the defense. And it's weird because it's kind of, if you know the details and you go through every bit of it, it feels like there was not so much a confession really at all. And on the surface, that's what we're told. This is how this case went wrong. This kid, Charles Erickson, he was confused. He goes in, he talks to police, he confesses to the crime. He says, me and my buddy Ryan did it. Why did we do it? We were looking to get more money for maybe drinks or some drugs or both. And it was Halloween night. We were up to no good. This is not totally out of the blue for Ryan Ferguson when he gets picked up because Charles has already contacted him and said, look, I'm seeing this story in the news. Mm -hmm. I saw this composite sketch. 
they're saying that two people were at the crime scene. Is this something we did? The bar we were drinking at was near this area. Did were we involved in this guy's murder? And of course, Ryan's telling him, dude, you're you're crazy. I don't know what you're talking about here. And then a couple months go by, he's picked up. Ryan's picked up. And what we're getting here in the interrogation rooms are two very different things. We have Ryan saying, I did not do this. I don't know what this other guy is telling you, but I was not there. I, I, I'm not just innocent of the murder. I'm innocent of it even having been there. I don't have the, didn't have the ability to even commit this crime because I wasn't physically there. Right. On the other hand, in the other room, what we got going on is Charles Erickson, who's saying he's kind of, he's less confessing to it, more so asking them, could I have done this? Yeah. Yeah. He, he says, could I have done this? And what has happened And Maggie, you hit the nail, you hit that nail right on the head. There was, he saw this in the news. He blacked out that night. He had a history of blacking out. And then he said he remembered some things of that night, but I think you're exactly right. I think he started obsessing about this crime and his mind started filling in some of the blanks on its own. By the time he gets in that room with police, police are saying, hey, walk us through the crime. Well, he's getting details wrong and they know that he's getting details wrong and they start to feed him information. So whatever blanks he couldn't figure out or fill in on his own, they start filling them in for him. And this is something I didn't get to put in the podcast either, but um, they took him to the crime scene. Mm -hmm. So he no. had a very clear, when he's later explaining how this happened, they took him there and showed him where it happened and said, this is where it happened. This is, you know, where he was found strangled with the belt. So he not only has been fed all this information, he was taken to the crime scene to give an even more accurate description of this this murder that he allegedly committed. Um, so it's, it's in, really, it's incredibly disturbing. When they pick up Brian Ferguson, one of the things that the d detective says to him is that I'm a fact gatherer, which will drive you nuts in this case. Cause if you're a fact gatherer, then you would have known pretty quickly that Charles knew nothing about the crime scene, the victim or anything that happened that night because he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. The other thing in the, these interrogations, I think for me, there's a detective that talks with Ryan Ferguson and he says, I have a, I have a son like you, so uh, you can't talk to your father right now, but let me step in for him. There's multiple times where I, I think I would have stopped as a detective and said, this isn't making sense. We need something that actually connects them to the scene where we're going to have to let these guys go. They knew that they did not do this. None of the evidence, you know, they tested all of the blood evidence, the hair evidence, all of this did not match Ryan and Charles. They knew they did not do this. And yet they, they literally concocted false statements from people. I mean, it, it is so, it is just beyond police misconduct. It is beyond prosecutor misconduct. And the prosecutor was Kevin Crane, and he is now a judge. So beyond like the misconduct, there is no ramifications for what they did. Putting two innocent people in, in prison is just so, so wild. Well, do you know this, and, and you might not, that because different departments work different ways and different cities work different ways. So in some cases, the detectives are the ones that push the trial to the prosecutors. There's a conversation that goes back and forth, but there's one entity normally that has the hierarchy to say, no, we're going to take this to trial. So we need you to go back and get more information. I didn't know if you knew how that worked in this department. I don't know. But um, again, like I was saying, you know, I ran into these instances in other cases where the prosecution didn't know all of the dirty things the cops were doing. In this instance, Crane is part of it. I mean, he, he seems like the dirty one to me. He coached Jerry Trump, who was the star witness, who is the entire reason that Ryan's case was um, 
vacated because he went on the stand and said, um, everything I said was a lie. Prosecutor Kevin Crane coached me on what to say. So to me, it seems like all of it was was dirty. Um, they all knew. They knew that the evidence was not matching them. And they just took two innocent freaking kids, 19-year-old kids, and locked them away. Right. So what we have as far as evidence that didn't match, the eyewitnesses, the janitors didn't match. Uh, they just said that these two boys were not the boys that they saw at the crime scene. Yeah. So to clarify on that, Shana Ornt, um, this was one of the Brady one of the numerous Brady violations, um, she specifically told the police um, when they showed her photos, that is not, it is not them. It is not Ryan Ferguson. It is not Charles Erickson. That is not who I saw at the scene. And so when it comes to trial, the defense had no idea about her. So that's the Brady violation. And of course, the prosecution doesn't bring on this witness because it doesn't match their story. She's saying consistently for years that is not who I saw. So, yeah, that's one of the pieces of evidence is the eyewitness did not see Charles and Ryan. Well, supposedly there was a lot of fingerprints all over the scene and none of uh, Charles or Ryan's fingerprints match any of those or a bloody palm print mm -hmm. or the shoe prints as well. Mm -hmm. None of them match. I mean, there is not a single shred of evidence. There's not a single witness who has not come and either recanted or said, I was coaxed, putting them there. I mean, there is zero evidence even putting them near there. Well, I think that that's a big thing in this trial that is not talked about enough in the system is I think there was some somewhere between 10 and 15 people that came forward and said, hey, I was interviewed and they asked me questions, but I felt like I was in an interrogation. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was doing something wrong and we, they have several of them come forward and say, I got to the point where I just told the prosecutor, whatever you want me to say, I'll say it. So you let me leave. Mm -hmm. This is not how we should be treating eyewitnesses. And, and the other thing too, that I want to step back to for a second, when you were talking about, um, you know, how they didn't have their parents there. Not only did they not have their parents there, they weren't read any kind of Miranda rights. They weren't under arrest. They had no idea. I mean, they're kids. You know, we work in this field. So we know, you know, if you're taken in, you're not under arrest. You don't have to say anything. You can leave. You can walk out. Um, he has no idea what's going on. Right. He's a scared kid. And But when I say he, I mean, I'm talking about Charles specifically because he's the confused one. I mean, Ryan is very adamant, like, y'all get the hell up away from me. I didn't have anything to do with this. But Charles is like, I don't know. I don't know. And he wanted to help so bad. And I talk about this in the podcast when, you know, now he understands he's innocent, but he didn't at the time because so much evidence was withheld from him. He didn't know that these were all false police reports given to him. He had no idea that DNA was exculpatory for him and Ryan. He didn't know any of this until around 2013. So he's yeah. sitting there thinking, I think we did this. Ryan is not trying to help or be helpful and I want to help. So, you know, what do I have to do to help him? A man is dead and I don't. Right. But that's not even the story he's being told because in the other room, like you said, if, if Ryan knew, Hey, I'm not under arrest. I wasn't there. F you. He could have just walked out. Yeah. And, and that's probably what he should have done. And then in this other room or later on, when they're talking to Charles, what do they do? They go, hey, by the way, your head's on the chopping block. And if you don't confess against Ryan, he's going to confess against you. And so for a 17-year-old. To 19 at the time, yeah. Or, yeah, 19 at the time of questioning. But he doesn't know that the, the cops are allowed to lie to you. Yep. I think most people would assume that the cops are not legally allowed to lie to you. So now you have somebody in the other room or nobody in the other room, but they're telling you, hey, if you don't confess, uh, you're going to get the, the bad end of the stick. And, and I, I, you know, there, that's something I haven't really looked into. Like, we know that's a thing that they're allowed to lie to you. I didn't know they were allowed to go as far as making fake police reports 
I didn't know that. You either. know, where is where is the line on what they can do to get, right. you know, a confession out of somebody? I think that's what's so tricky here because we have Charles Erickson who's saying he's asking, did I do this? I may have done this. I don't know. He's flat out telling them, I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. He says that several times when they, when he can't get a question, right? He goes, well, now I don't even know if I did this. Maybe I'm crazy. Yeah, he or gives maybe them I'm making this up. Several, yeah. several outs. And the thing is, it starts off as a slippery slope. I get it from the police end. From the police end, they're like, look, we we have reason to believe we might be looking for two perpetrators or one attacker and one witness. Now we have this kid who comes forward, says, me and my buddy, I think we did this. And of course, you got one guy in one room and one guy in the other. One guy saying, we might have done this. The other guy saying, go to hell. I didn't do this. That happens in every crime that's committed by two people. They get one person saying they did and one person saying that they did. And so I get that from the police angle. But the problem with Erickson's confession then becomes he can't answer these questions. They start filling in the blanks for him. And as soon as he agreed that, yes, it was a belt, it was a belt that Ryan took off of the victim put it around the victim's neck and choked him to death. When he agreed that, yes, it was a belt, their hold back information, he sealed his fate right then and there. And it goes so far as he keeps asking them, maybe I didn't do this. I don't know if I did or not. And what you guys are talking about is they are giving outside confirmation to him to say, yes, you did. You're right to come and tell us this because we got these other people that are that are backing up portions of your story. We got, who was it, a, a friend of theirs named Dallas, who all of a sudden says now that they saw, that we, we know this guy, Dallas, he saw you near the crime scene. So everything you are telling us must be true. And that's where it's crazy because you're not having somebody walk in and, and pounding their fist on the table and saying, this is what I did. This is how we did it. And this is why. No, you're, you, you, have, you have a guy going, I'm not certain if I did this or not. I have a little snapshots. I'm confused about that night. And they're filling in the blanks for him and offering confirmation for him. So now tell us more because you're going to fry for this. And if whoever speaks first is going to win in this case, Ryan's going to turn on you. So start telling us everything. Right. And I think the other thing that people are also confused about is um, Charles didn't turn himself in. It was a Crime Stoppers tip because people had heard him kind of saying, I don't remember that night. I wonder if I had something to do with it. And someone called Crime Stoppers saying, hey, look, Charles Erickson is you know, talking about this murder. And that's when they brought him in. Who knows what would have happened if someone didn't call Crime Stoppers but yeah, that that's how they wound up in in questioning. Paul, is it true that once he made contact with Ryan to say, "Hey, did we do this?" That not only were there rumors, uh, people started circulating rumors saying that that Eric was involved, but that Ryan was not involved. I don't know about that. Um, I know Ryan was saying, you know, we had nothing to do with this, and Ryan kind of went about his life like just like charles shut up like what are you even talking about i don't know if there were rumors about ryan not being involved but i know charles was definitely talking to people he was really worried you know just trying to figure out what what was going on what this ultimately leads to though nobody bothers to pull the emergency brake and hit stop on this thing everybody just keeps letting it go further and further and then at some point the prosecutor starts saying all right Let's, we're not only, not only we're not going to stop this train, we're going to add fuel to the fire. We're going to put witnesses on the stand, have them say things that they know are not true because when they don't get a confession, what they're hoping for police is like, all right, we got one half of the parties confessing. Let's get Ryan Ferguson to confess too. And he doesn't, he does not waver on his innocence and they have to take Ryan to trial. This is going to get a deal, a plea deal for Charles Erickson. Yeah, Charles takes a 25 to life second degree murder for his testimony against against Ryan. And that's one of these things, too. The death penalty was on the table. So he was also absolutely terrified of the death penalty. And you guys know we see this almost in every 
single, if not every single false confession is the death penalty is on the table. And they're saying, if you don't say something, you're going up for the death penalty. If you just say something, you know, we'll take it off the table. But isn't it more likely that if he was convicted of first degree murder, that death penalty would be on the table and it wouldn't be really likely that death penalty would be on the table for murder in the second. Right. Well, that's why he took the plea because he was up for first degree murder. He took the plea to get the death penalty off the table. Yeah. And this, they're going to charge Ryan Ferguson with first Mm -hmm. degree murder and they need him to testify. They need Charles Erickson to testify at Ryan's trial. And I'll tell you what, having seen portions of that trial, look, the, the prosecutor very strategically had things laid out with different quote unquote witnesses the defense attorney seemed scatterbrained, seemed that he didn't prepare for this case. He calls Ryan to testify. Ryan was not prepared to take the stand. He was not trained on how to answer the questions. But the thing w- that was so shocking to me, where you have this confused Charles Erickson when he's talking to police, maybe Ryan strangled the guy with a shirt. Oh, it wasn't a shirt. Maybe it was a bungee cord. Oh, it wasn't a bungee cord. We know it was his belt. Okay. Ryan did it with the belt. But when Charles walks into that court, it is shocking. It is stunning. He walks right in and he throws a death stare, a death glance over at Ryan Ferguson, who's sitting in the defendant's chair. He walks up to the stand and now he, it's like he's an expert on the case all of a sudden. He's, he, (laughs) The script is completely flipped, and he's up there with the dramatics. He's acting, reenacting the the murder for the jury. He was extremely believable, and he had this look of like anger against Ryan Ferguson while he's on the stand. He didn't hide his face from Ryan in shame or 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 guilt or anything like that. He looked at him dead on and said, "This is what he did. This is what I did. I am here today because." I am 100% guilty of this murder. Yeah, and and I asked him about that because it is really scary to watch. Um, And, you know, when you're only seeing this, when you're watching, you know, Dream Killer and other things that have been put out about this case, I mean, you're watching these clips and you are thinking, wow, Charles is a really messed up person. Like, what is he doing? And I asked him that. I said, you know, you looked like, you know, you had the fire of hell in your eyes, like ready to go for Ryan. Like, what was that about? And he said, I thought Ryan was being a bad guy. I thought that he was not taking responsibility for what we did. And I was going to do that. I was going to be the one to, you know, give Kent Heitholt's family the justice that they deserved. And Ryan wasn't doing that. Yeah. And then they bring him in in shackles and the black and white jumpsuit. I mean, it's very theatrical. And like you said, um, Nick, when they bring Ryan Ferguson on the the stand, he's very ill prepared and just little mannerisms that he has. He kind of smirks and chuckles at things. And I think that made him come off uh, insincere and like he wasn't taking this trial seriously. I think, you know, how it's like how could you it's like so ridiculous at least in ryan's perspective it's like this is absolutely insane it's like what is even happening like i don't i can't even imagine what's going through ryan's head at this point because he knows they weren't there he's like this is absolutely bonkers right and that's the thing is that's the reason why this case always sticks with me so much is you just went out with one of your friends that night couple years later that friend's calling you going hey man were we involved in a murder i mean could you imagine how much your brain would explode what are you talking about we're involved in a murder get out of here months later being arrested or being pulled into questioning wait this this knucklehead's telling you that maybe he had a dream and we murdered somebody we weren't even there And probably thinking the whole time, they're going to let me go, and that's going to be it. And nope, now you're arrested. Now you're in jail. They're in jail for over two years before they went to trial. I don't know if I could stand that. If I, it's supposed to be innocent till proven guilty, but 
you're in jail for two years before you even go to trial. It's and this is why you know so much of it focuses on Ryan because it it's you know this poor kid was railroaded by his friend and the police and you know he is just like what is happening and and you feel really bad for him but at the same time we also forget that here's Charles Erickson an incredibly vulnerable 19 year old that was completely taken advantage of by the police and the prosecutor and and Ryan has admit that you know when Ryan was released he I put it in the podcast a statement that he said he says um Charles is a lot of things but he's not guilty of this murder. Naturally, Ryan's going to feel a certain way towards someone who put him in prison for 10 years. But, you know, I know from that statement that Ryan knows that, that Charles had a lot of issues and the police took advantage of that. Well, and his whole story just doesn't, it doesn't track. I mean, he says we left the bar in order to go rob someone to get more money for drinks and drugs. And This Kent Heitholt murder scene is a bloody mess. Chuck says we returned to the bar afterwards and had some more drinks. And we have witnesses who worked at the bar, who were at the bar that said, no, the bar Mm -hmm. closed. Closed before we believe Kent Heitholt was even murdered because they call in, the janitors call in to uh, 911, I believe at uh, Mm 2.26 a.m. And now... Chuck Erickson saying we, we killed this man and we returned to the bar, which we know could not have happened because the bar was not open. And then on top of that, they would have been a bloody Mm -hmm. mess and they're just going to hang out there. That's the thing too. They also, not only did none of the evidence at the scene match Charles and Ryan, but they searched their, I forget who's, I think it was Ryan's car because Ryan was driving, but whichever car they were driving in, they searched, they searched Charles's, you know, clothing from that night. There's nothing nothing there's no blood there's no evidence and that's the whole point they would have been a bloody mess there would have been blood in that car you know there would have been something and again it's it's hard not to fault the detectives or the prosecutors but i i do feel that maybe with somebody coming forward saying i don't know if i did this i possibly could have i think maybe you push further than you normally would and you dig deeper than you normally would. But I think at the end of the day, you still come to the conclusion that neither one of these boys were at the scene of the crime. So they therefore could have committed the crime. Yeah. And again, there was multiple witnesses, you know, like you said, the bar saying it was closed, like no, people were alibying for them and they just pushed ahead. And I think to going back to what you said, you know, I, I feel like prosecutor Kevin Crane. I mean, we have Jerry Trump specifically saying he was coached by him. I feel like he was really pushing for this conviction. And again, he's a judge now. So this was like a big, this was a big win for him um, in, in a stepping stone in his career. So, you know, the whole thing was just very dirty. Well, and Shauna Ort says that she told prosecuting attorney Kevin Crane that that Ryan Ferguson is not the man that I saw in the parking lot. So, and he kind of conveniently leaves that out. He doesn't get her to change her story, but he never says point to, do you see the man that you saw that night in the parking lot in this room at court here today? He never asked that question. Then of course, Ryan Ferguson's attorney is too scared to ask that same question because he doesn't know what the witness is going to say. That's what's bizarre. That shows you how, the lack of preparedness on the defense on their end, there were holes to be poked in this story and this narrative and the evidence itself, but he didn't bother poking any of those holes because he didn't really didn't seem like he prepared much for this. Had he interviewed Shauna Arndt in advance, he could have asked her that question in a deposition, found out in advance what she was going to say and realize, wow, that's some powerful information that this jury should know about my client. But he didn't know to do that because he didn't he didn't put in the work. Well, and again, this is so it's so bizarre. And one of the reasons is because the system is set up to have checks and balances. And in this case, it's it's such a perfect storm. We have this kid that doesn't remember, thinks they did something bad. Now he's confessing against you. You're 
uh, attorney, your defense attorney that you hire, that everybody tells you this guy's the best, shows up so unprepared. I mean, at one point, he's pointing to um, a reference map and talking about a restaurant, and the restaurant's not even on the map yeah. because cause it was an old map. This guy was so <laughs> ill-prepared. And then, again, the perfect storm. Cops that went too far, a prosecution that probably said, hey, look, if we can get the confession, doesn't matter if it's false or not, if we can get that confession, I can get a conviction. Well, that was in his opening statement. In Crane's opening statement, he points, he says, you know, there's no DNA linking them to this. All the DNA is pointing away from them, but uh, he's confessing. So that's all you need to worry about. Well, not even not DNA. I, I believe Crane said there is zero physical yeah. evidence. Yeah. There's, I mean, the the amount of douchebaggery he talks with. I mean, I wouldn't even call it a swagger. It's he is so douchey at times. This man is a judge now. The, he is presiding over cases now. I guess on one hand, people could go, "Well, he's you know, taxpayers pay his salary, and he he got the conviction um, by bending the rules." Right. Well, and interrogating, <laughs> interrogating eyewitnesses. Now, because of his conviction, the state owes ten million dollars to Ryan Ferguson alone. That, not to mention, when yeah. Charles gets out, who's done more time than that. I mean, what is this conviction was purely for his own political career gain. It, there is no way to say that this helped society. And it clearly did not help because, again, taxpayer money is now going to paying a wrongful conviction settlement and the real killers are still out there. Kent Hyatt-Hold's family does not have any kind of justice. And who knows what these people have done in the meantime? In fact, I, I do know what two of these people have done in the meantime. And there was another murder. Here's a couple things about this case. Is again, the focus normally goes on Ryan Ferguson. He's definitely a victim in this case. As much so, I believe Charles is a victim in this case. But like you just said, Kent is the victim that is most forgotten in this case. His family is forgotten in this case. And just like the last person that saw him, Michael Boyd, which was a sports writer, which worked under Kent, there was multiple things early on. One, he puts himself at the crime scene. He at one point says he left at 2, later says he left at 2.20. In one interview, he says he drove his car. Another interview, he says he drove his wife's car. There was pieces of paper that had a schedule on it that would have been Michael Boyd's schedule that was found underneath Kent's car. There was rumors that they had an argument. Mm -hmm. um, the car that people believe Michael was driving at the time, he got rid of. So uh, he also said when he came back to work that there was um, the, the medics were still there. That was a lie. There's also, he said um, a couple different things about the crime scene um, that he shouldn't even, he shouldn't have known uh, or he changed the story about. So there was enough reason to look into that individual and I'm sure they did a little bit. But uh, where, where do you stand on, on, on Michael Boyd? Yeah, you, you just named everything that makes him, you know, a better person of interest than Charles and Ryan. I don't really know in that two year span before Charles and Ryan came on the radar how much they looked into Boyd. Clearly, something turned them away from him. Um, you know, well, that I what I question is is it the the janitors are correct in their eyewitness that they both saw two individuals that were Caucasian? So I think that's what it Michael was, Boyd. yeah. Yeah, Boyd is not, he's not white. Um, he's a dark-skinned man, um, and he was solo, and the janitor said they saw two young white men. Again, though, who knows if they were just pedestrians walking by, because allegedly they said, hey, someone's hurt, 
So who knows if they were the actual killers or if they just saw something. It could have been Boyd. But, you know, in doing subsequent investigation and and talking a lot with people who know this case really well, there are two people that were uncovered by Zellner's private investigators that are very good suspects in 2005 commit another murder. Similar. Similar. Like a very random murder who, who they were linked to this murder and allegedly have said that they commit other murders like this and they look very much like the sketch one of the men so personally i think they are much better suspects than boyd i think boyd is just an odd odd duck and just doesn't remember things yeah i i I don't think it was boyd but he he should have been looked into much more than he was Thanks for joining us here in the garage. Make sure you go to the website, truecrimegarage.com. Sign up on our mailing list. We're going to have two more garage sales for the rest of the year. If you're not on the mailing list, you won't be able to get the discount code. So make sure you do that at truecrimegarage.com. And have a beer with me on Untapped. I'm under True Crime Garage. Until tomorrow, be good, be kind, and don't let it. list is now Angie, and we've heard a lot of theories about why. I thought it was an eco-move. Fewer words, less paper. No, it was so you could say it faster. No, it's to be more iconic. Must be a tech thing. But those aren't quite right. It's because now you can compare upfront prices, book a service instantly, and even get your project handled from start to finish. Sounds easy. It is, and it makes us so much more than just a list. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I. Or download the app today.